Last time we left off in chapter 11, Romans 11, 34 and 35, which said, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? You see, there's no way that we can fully comprehend the mind of the Lord. The Bible is God giving you a piece of his mind. That's amazing to me because we can't even understand a just a piece of his mind. I'm glad that we can't get it all in just one sitting. It, it takes a lifetime to get anywhere in the scriptures. And then after you die, someone can build on what you found out. And then someone can build on what that person found out. But you never can even get a piece of his mind down pat. It seems... It seems, though, today that people have quit building on what other people left. The old guys were really building and putting all kinds of Bible material out for people to soak up and to read. But now people have quit reading the Bible. They've, they've quit building. Uh, they've stopped desiring the mind of the Lord. Their, their Bible is closed. They honestly don't even understand why you, you read it so much. If you're a Bible reader and they see you reading the Bible, they're like... Why do you read that Bible so much? You know, how come you're not doing something else? How come you're not on Facebook and TikTok like me? Now, Romans 12. In Romans 12, you're going to see practical duties for every Christian. And it has the great verse in Romans 12, 1, which says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We may not do animal sacrifices, but we can give ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Every morning when we wake up, we can choose to do the right thing. Sacrifice what your flesh wants to do and do what God wants to do. Your flesh may want to scroll on social media. Read the Bible anyway. It says in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When I got saved, I remember the process of my mind being transformed. I remember reading articles by David J. Stewart against rock music and things like that. And my mind had to be transformed and start thinking differently how it thought before. I remember listening to Danny Castle preach for about eight hours a day and the morals and the Bible standards he, he taught really started to mold my mind, made me think differently about things, gave me biblical common sense about things. Instead of watching movies and listening to music and letting the world conform me to that, I got a hold of different communications. I started hanging out with the right people, listening to the right stuff, reading the right things. Romans 12, 14 says, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. That's a good verse to live by. A soft answer turns away wrath, as it says in Proverbs. You'll be a lot better off if you just ignore people or be kind to evil people. Romans 12, 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. At work, when someone does something to someone else, they always feel the need to retaliate. When someone doesn't do all of their job on the previous shift, then the next shift will try to do something mean to the shift in return. When someone does you wrong, just do right anyway. It says in Romans 12, 18, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I don't have to go along with what sinful men say at work, but I can live peaceably with, with them. It isn't my job to tell them to quit cussing. Everybody at work cusses and cusses like a sailor. I think they got every right to cuss. If I can make them stop cussing, then they can stop me from saying what God wants me to say. I think everyone should be able to say what they want to say. And my job is to give them the gospel. My job isn't, isn't to clean up the mouth of a lost person. They're going to have filthy communication. That's just how it is. It says in Romans twelve nineteen, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So you're robbing God when you steal his vengeance. God wants to get the revenge. He's the ultimate avenger. 
So he says in Romans 12, 20, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Any time that someone did me wrong and I was nice to them back, they usually respond back nicely. People have their defenses up. You see, everywhere you go, people already have their defenses up before you even meet them because they're so used to everybody being jerks around them. So it's made them a regular little jerk themselves. So just when you come up to them, they're automatically going to be a jerk because they expect you're going to be one too. So when they see you respond with kindness, they're taken back by it a little bit and they will most likely start being nicer to you. So Paul says in Romans 12, 21, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. If they're mean to you, they're evil to you, just be nice back. That There is your weapon. You overcome evil with good. Hebrews 6, 5 talks about the good word of God. That's what's good. Many times the world refers to the Bible as the good book, but that is an understatement. But at the same time, it is the good book. You overcome evil with good. Hebrews 4, 12 says... The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. There's your weapon. Now, Romans 13. This is about how should Christians react to authority. Romans 13, 1 through 4. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Would thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister, for he is the, for he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. The best thing to do is to submit to authority figures in life until they cross God's laws. I'll abide by the authority of the government, by the authority of the supervisors at work, the police, or any authority figure in life, as long as it doesn't cross what God says. You see, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, but when authorities begin to cross what God says, then rebellion becomes godly. But, uh, you know, I have no reason to not pull over when a cop's chasing me, or a cop's got his lights turned on after me you know i have no reason to not abide by the laws as long as they don't go against god's laws i'm glad that there's laws in place i'm glad that there's police officers and things like that because you know i don't want a bunch of crazy killers running out on the loose and things like that romans 13 8 and 9 oh no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law for this thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal thou shalt not bear false witness thou shalt not covet and if there be any other commandment it is briefly comprehended in this saying namely thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself so you fulfill the law you see listen you fulfill the law by loving your neighbor because if you consistently love others then you're not going to commit adultery with his wife. If you consistently love a person, you're not going to steal this stuff. If you consistently love a person, you're not going to lie to him or about him. You won't kill him. You won't envy him. You won't covet any, everything he has. You'll be happy he's got a beautiful wife. You'll be happy that he's got a nice car. You'll be happy that he has a nice house. You'll be happy that he's got a good relationship with the Lord and passes out tracts and puts Bible verse bumper, bumper stickers on his car and reads his Bible that stuff won't make you jealous if you love that person because that's going to be what you want him to do. If you really love your kids, you're not going to be jealous of them. You know, there's parents that are jealous of their kids that hate their kids. They hate hearing good things that are happening to their kids because they wish it was happening to them. Many times someone begins to covet their neighbor's life. They deceive and they lie to their neighbor and they lie about him. And they just want what, what he has so bad that they might even eventually kill him and steal what he has. They don't really love their neighbor. There have been plenty of times that a person killed a man just to get his wife or something that he had. You know, stealing and covetousness and killing, it all goes together. Like it says in James 4, 1 and 2, From whence come wars and fightings among you? 
Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Romans 13.10 says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love fulfills the law because if you love a person, then you're going to be godly to that person. Romans 13.11 And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Not the salvation of our soul, but the redemption of our body. That is when you get a glorified body at the rapture. My soul is saved, but I need a new body. That is what a lot of Christians don't understand. They don't realize that their flesh doesn't get saved when they got saved. We are waiting on Jesus to change our vile body, to redeem this vile body. Now, Romans chapter 14, in this chapter, you're going to see about having the right attitude with other Christians when it comes to our own personal convictions. Romans 14, 5 says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another man another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You see, one man believes Sunday is the most special day of the week. Another man believes Saturday is a special day. There are some churches that meet on different days. Some churches meet on Thursday night instead of Wednesday night. Some churches may even meet on a day other than Sunday because for whatever reason it's not possible for them to meet on Sunday. I know of churches like that. I know of some churches that meet twice on Sunday. The church I go to meets twice on Sunday, once on Wednesday. But then you got some other churches that don't meet on Wednesday, but they meet on Thursday. When it comes right down to it, you can't judge a man's spirituality by how many times he attends a church a week. Uh, I know of this one church that has a Sunday morning service so long that they don't even have a Sunday night. Yet they have, they got the same amount of church in that other churches had just in that one service. I mean, some churches, they have an hour, uh, an hour or two Sunday morning and then an hour Sunday night. That's about three hours. While some churches have like three to four hours on Sunday morning. They got just as much time in in one service as another church did. Does this mean that they're less spiritual because they just had one service on Sunday? I don't believe so. I don't believe that you can judge someone's spirituality by how, by how many hours or days or times that they're in church a week. Some people see Christmas Day as a day that you must celebrate. Uh, nothing says that you have to celebrate Christmas Day. I mean, we're happy that, that you know, we're happy that the Lord was virgin born. But nothing says that we have to have a day to celebrate the virgin birth of Christ. While at the same time, some people say Christmas is pagan and you, you just shouldn't have anything to do with it. You know, I'll, I'll listen to a lot of preachers that believe that, really good preachers that are, are some of my favorites, like James Knox and David Hoffman. They they don't have uh, celebrate Christmas at all because of its pagan roots. And my view is, if you want to do Christmas, then do it. I mean, it, but if you can't have a clear conscience about it, then don't do it. I mean, I just personally don't see anything wrong with swapping gifts, eating dinner, and spending time with family. You know, how is having a tree any different than having any type of decoration in your house. You know, who says you even have to have a tree? Some Christians call them bell bushes, and I'm fine with that. I, I really don't care because I like their zeal. I really like that person's zeal for standing up for what they believe and think is right, and I don't see how having a tree in your house is worse than having a laptop or, t or a TV, though. I mean, I, I completely admire their stand against not having a tree, not celebrate Christmas because they think that they're doing right. But at the same time, I don't see how you can say it's wrong to have a tree, but it's not wrong to have a laptop or a TV. Because you can get into a lot more sin with a TV than with a Christmas tree. You know, I'm not worshiping a tree. I really don't even think about it. You know, the, the family likes for me to get it out. They like to put ornaments on it and then... Nobody really pays much attention to the tree until it's time to take it back down. It was just something you kind of did with your family every year. 
in Romans 14, 6 through 10, it says, He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So when it comes to the Christmas thing, I, I just don't judge those who are against it because of because they're against it because of the pagan roots. I think that's cool. It's fine with me that they're against it, that they don't celebrate it. And, you know, if I'm around that person around Christmas, I just won't even talk about Christmas. I mean, I really don't talk about it much anyway. But the average Christian uh, who celebrates Christmas isn't worshiping a tree or anything like that. They have no idea about the pagan roots behind it. And if you said that to them, they probably would su suspect you of lying. If you told them to look it up, they're not going to. They're just... They're just going to think that you're crazy, which is, that's fine too. But, you know, I don't believe, I just, I said that to say, you know, they, people aren't, are not using that time as a time to worship a tree. If, if they're worshiping anything, they're just continuing to worship their self and their money and the material possessions that they have. And that's what re really Christmas has become about is, uh, what can you get each year? So, that's what's really wrong with it today. Romans fourteen ten through 12. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Notice how the Bible is always about, you know, you need to examine yourself first. You're going to give account of yourself to God Quit being worried about so much what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is not doing, and examine yourself. Make sure that you're right before you go around judging anybody else. But if you have believed on Christ, then you're saved. But you're still going to give account of what you have done for the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. You won't be judged on whether or not you're going to heaven or hell. You're not going to be judged on your sins. You're going to be judged on your Christian service. What have you done for the Lord? Was it good? Was it with the right motive? It says in Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Notice that the kingdom of God is not physical things, it's spiritual things. It isn't meat and drink, but rather righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of heaven is different, it's physical. Yeah, the violent can take it by force, it's a physical kingdom. Romans 15 you're going to see that pleasing the Lord and others is key. Romans 15, 1 through 3. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. The spirit of today is love yourself first. The spirit of today is look out for old number one. The spirit of today is do what makes you happy. But that's all baloney when it comes to the Bible. Even Christ pleased not himself. So please, you should please the Lord first, please others second, and you dead last. Don't please yourself first. Don't love yourself first. Don't just worry about making yourself happy. It's just all about you for most people. In Romans 16, you see Paul's greetings, salutations, warning, and closing. And he says a bunch of names in this chapter showing you that Paul had a lot to do with other people after he was saved. You know, it's a temptation of a lot of us sometimes to get away from everybody and be on our own, be a lone ranger, be by ourselves. I mean, if I got any temptation, it's the temptation of isolation. I'm not much of a people person at all. I mean, I can carry on a conversation. I can be friendly. But I've always been a loner. I've always been alone other than with my family and my adult life. But before that, I spent, I would say... 
90% of my time was spent completely alone. But if some, uh, but you know, if someone just gets alone too much, I mean, we all need to be alone to a certain extent to get close to God, to read the Bible, to have time in prayer. But you can get alone too much to where you'll start thinking you're the only one that's right. You'll start thinking that you're the only one right with God and you'll become this person that's just in judgment of everybody. You have your complete own way of thinking. You've never heard anybody else's way of thinking. You don't want to hear of anybody else's way of thinking or the way they see the Bible or look at the Bible and you just become very unbalanced and rude and mean and crude. And I've seen that happen to many preachers that I used to listen to. But Paul says in Romans 16, 7, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who were of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. And this is a verse I use all the time, and that's why I took it out of this chapter. Because if someone was in Christ before Paul, then that means the body didn't start with Paul. And I believe in Christ obviously has to refer to in the body of Christ here, and not just somebody who's a saint in general, because at the time of this writing, all these people mentioned would have been in the body. So I believe when Paul says in Christ here that he is referring to in the body of Christ. Those who believe the body started with Paul have to make the phrase in Christ here refer to people who were just in the Lord without being in the body. But when Paul wrote this, in Christ when they dictated it when Paul was speaking in Christ would have meant in the body if someone was in Christ they would have been in the body at the time of this writing so I mean I just think it's a stretch to say well he's just referring to people that were in the Lord but not in the body I believe that they were in Christ as in in the body of Christ so therefore the body of Christ did not start with Paul because they were in Christ before him Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's that spiritual baptism again. You see, at salvation, you're spiritually baptized into the body of Christ, making you in Christ. Now, Romans 16.17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. You see, sometimes a person can get a hobby horse teaching and divide whole groups of Christians over it, and Paul says to avoid these kind of people. Romans 16, 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and first speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Many times people can learn their false doctrines very well, and they will know them even better than most Christians know their right Bible doctrine. And this makes those uh, well-meaning Christians who've got the right Bible doctrine, it makes them be in danger of being deceived. They don't know the right doctrine good enough. They may have the right doctrine. They may believe eternal security in the King James Bible, but they have no idea why they believed it other than their pastor says so and their papa said so. You know, they need to be more sharp on the scriptures so that they're not deceived by good words and fair speeches that deceive the hearts of the simple. Romans 16, 20, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, this is the second coming. At the second coming, the Lord will let us bruise Satan under our feet shortly. Paul is saying this is going to happen shortly. Down south, people say, I'll be there shortly or I'll be there directly. In the eyes of the Lord, this would happen soon because a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a one day. Time goes by, by, by very fast for the Lord. Romans 16, 25, and 26. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Paul was given revelation about things that had been kept secret, secret since the world began. He gave us the doctrines for the church. And this is why his epistles are doctrinally to us. Anything you read in the Bible needs to be filtered through the Pauline epistles so you know to apply it to yourself directly, doctrinally, like the, the like direct doctrine for you, or maybe indirectly, as in inspirationally, or, you know, just you need to familiar, familiarize yourself with the Pauline epistles. 
So that way, when you're back there reading the Old Testament, you don't think, well, I need to go sacrifice an animal. Or I need to worship and only on the Sabbath day or worship only in a temple or something somewhere. You know, you need to rightly divide, filter everything through the Pauline epistles. Now, Paul's epistles is not the only doctrine for us, but it's where we establish ourselves in the right doctrine for us. You can find doctrine for us out of any book of the Bible, but you get your doctrine established and use the Pauline epistles as the filter. But this is the end of the overview of the book of Romans.